All right, we're back. So we should have, you should have been able to find a video that walks you through how resampling stats works. And then a real short video kind of on the history of William Seeley Gossett, also known as student. And then a chalk talk about PPES calculations and degrees of freedom. So next we're going to compare our calculated t-value from that last chalk talk video to a table of t-values. So what does the t distribution look like? Here you can see um, t, which is it's a pretty normal looking, a little squished maybe um, distribution. And you can see how the distribution changes as the degrees of freedom change from one to two to five to infinity. Um, so basically the t distribution um, varies you know, roughly between negative four and positive four. Um, and you can calculate values of t much larger than that from your real data. And when you have a really big t values, that generally means that you have a significant difference between your two means. So how do we know exactly what your p value is? You, you use a table, so this is one way to do it. Um, so statistics books used to have just tables and tables of values in the back. And so you would take your calculated value with t and eight degrees of freedom to the table and you would go, um, you'd be able to go down this, um, this row here, gives you the degrees of freedom, V degrees of freedom. And so we know for our um, example, our, our T was, had eight degrees of freedom and our calculated value was negative 3.21. So these are all um, in the positive, but basically we're looking for values larger than um, 3.21. And, and what we can see is that at a P, at an alpha of 0.05, our calculated or our critical T value, sorry, our critical T value would be um, 1.86. Um, so right here, so you go degrees of freedom eight and an alpha of 0.05. As long as our T value is greater than 1.86, then we can reject the null hypothesis. Oops. So, um, this is the, what we call the critical value of t. And since our value is bigger than that, we can reject the null hypothesis. Now, technically, our value of t is um, bigger. And so we could go all the way over to here um, because our value of 3.2 is somewhere in between 2.896 and 3.35. That actually tells us that our p value associated with the t value of 3.21 is less than 0 0.01. So we would report p less than 0 0.01. So what is this p-value thing? P-values are basically a guide to whether you're going to reject the null hypothesis or accept it. And so it's just, it's like a yes, no. That's all it really is. So if it's less than 0 0.05, then you can reject the null hypothesis. Our null hypothesis was that the mean number of ant mounds in forests would equal the mean number of ant mounds in the field. And so at a p-value of less than 0 0.01, we can reject the null hypothesis. They are not equal, okay? The means are not equal. And we could say by after looking at the data and noticing that there are more ant mounds on average in the field, we could say there are significantly more ant mounds in fields compared to forests. And then we would put our statistics in parentheses as evidence to support that claim. That's where statistics belong. They don't belong as nouns in your sentences. So you would say this statement, there are significantly more ant mounds in fields compared to forests. And we would say the evidence in parentheses is a T with eight degrees of freedom is negative 3.21 and a P less than 0.01. Okay, so P values um, are part of the evidence from the statistical test. A p-value measures the probability that observed or more extreme values would be found if the null hypothesis were true. Okay, so that's a little bit tricky to understand. Um, a p-value is also a probability that you're making what's called a type one error when you're accidentally rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually true. So type one and type two errors, I'm just gonna take a minute to explain them. And it's important to understand that in reality, whether we can know this or not, the null hypothesis is either true or false, okay? So it, it's, it's a, it's a, it, there's reality, there's truth out there. Now our job is to find it, right? So if we were all knowing and had complete information, 
we would just know whether there were more ant mounds in the field or in the forest. And we wouldn't need statistics, but we're not all knowing. So this table shows you in reality over here, the null is either true or it's false, okay? But we don't know which it is. And so we run our tests and we do our work and maybe we accept the null. Now, if we accept the null and it's true, then we're correct, we've made the right choice. Or if we reject the null and the null is actually false, then we're also correct. So that's what we're hoping for. We wanna be in one of these two boxes. Now, if we reject the null, but it's actually true, we're making a type one error. Okay. If we accept the null, but it's actually false, then we're making a type two error. And we want to minimize both the type one error and the type two error if we can, but we can't minimize them both at the same time. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about these two types of errors. So type one error, alpha is basically false positive. So say we do a study and we report that a pollutant causes health problems when it actually doesn't. Or say you go to the doctor and they tell you you have cancer, but you actually don't, right? So those are bad things, okay? That's a little different. A type two error, um, beta, is a false negative. In this case, they test you for cancer. You test negative, but you actually have it. So uh, there's some differences in terms of different types of sciences. In ecology, we try to minimize type one errors. Um, and in medicine, they try to minimize type two. So you cannot minimize both alpha and beta at the same time. We would rather um, be wrong in the way that, you know, there is an effect, but we don't see it, than um, to basically say there is an effect when there isn't one as ecologists. And doctors would rather tell you that you are sick and treat you as if you are, than to let you be sick and not know about it and not get treated. Okay? So there's some differences between science. The different types of sciences there. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is the t-test. A parametric t-test has some assumptions. So first of all, all tests, resampling, parametric tests require that your data were collected randomly and that each measurement is independent of the others. Okay, so resampling tests have those two assumptions. Now those two assumptions hold for parametric tests as well, but they have two additional assumptions. One is that populations are normally distributed, and two is that populations are equally variable. So let's talk about those two things. So first of all, normality. So this normal kind of bell-shaped curve, right, we want to make sure that our data were collected from a normally distributed population. We can use what's called a Shapiro-Wilkes test to test for that. The null hypothesis for a Shapiro-Wilkes test is that the data are normally distributed. Okay, so in this case, we don't want to reject the null. We actually want to be able to use a t-test so we're hoping for a p-value that's greater than 0.05. This feels kind of backwards to some students, but it's really the same. It's just you're setting up a null hypothesis, and in this case, you just don't want to reject it, okay? And so, you know, here's, here's a figure showing a normal distribution. Um, so we're, we're, we're hoping that our data were collected from a normally distributed population. Second hypothesis, or second assumption, um, oh, sorry, here's another joke. Um, I know. It's so funny, right? The normal distribution, the paranormal distribution. All right, so the second assumption is that the samples are equally variable, okay? So here you can see maybe a little bit less variation for the field samples compared to the forest samples. And so to test whether these really are equally variable, we use what's called a Levine's test. And Levine's test has a kind of a similar setup. The null hypothesis is that the data are equally variable. But there's no difference in variation between the two mean or to, between the two groups. And so again, if your p-value is less than 0.05, you reject the null and your data, oops, your data are not equally variable. So there's a little typo there. Um, you want your p-value to be greater than 0.05 again in this, in this case for the Levine's test. So here's the steps for a t-test. First, sample randomly and independently. Second, choose a resampling test. Great, go to number three a parametric test, then test for the assumptions of normality and equality of variance. If you pass those tests, then you can run your test, either run a resampling t-test or a parametric t-test. If your p-value from that test is less than 0.05, reject the null hypothesis. The means are not equal. 
if the p-value is greater than 0.05, you cannot reject the null hypothesis and the means are not, um, the means are equal to one another. You would then interpret your results and place your statistics in parentheses. Don't let them become nouns in your sentences. Not okay. All right, so um, watch the last video and that's when I'll walk you through how to do a t-test and test for these assumptions in jump. All right, great, thanks.